Okay, I know that Demon Slayer has ended in a while, but Mr. Yosakura Sensei says, I surprisingly really enjoyed Demon Slayer's Hashira training. Let's see if this is going to be a spicy video. But today, I'm willing to start a dialogue. We're going to yeah. start the video with me simply saying that Demon Slayer's Hashira training was yeah. better than Swordsmith Village in terms of the anime content. Ooh, that's a spicy nuclear take immediately. And you know what? I think that if you take the finale of Hashira training, that gave me more hype. That gave me the same feelings of desperation and despair and threat that I felt in Entertainment District arc that I could not feel in Swordsmith Village. If you combine all of the Swordsmith Village arc episodes and compare it to the Hashira training, I'm not sure if the same can be said, but... This is a hot take that I'm willing to get behind. I have to break your neck. Before going any further, I am once again prefacing this by saying I'm anime only, so manga readers, put your pitchforks down, I see you typing up a storm. Now this right. isn't to say that Swordsmith Village is bad, because all in all, it's okay, but I can understand why out of all the arcs, this may be the one that's more forgettable. In my own personal- Exactly, Swordsmith Village arc, for whatever reason, I just didn't feel the same level of danger. Not at any single point did I think that our characters were gonna die. Even people, even like the Nezco scene in the sunlight, it's just like, do you really think that Nezco is gonna die there? Like, no fucking shot. You think that Nezco is gonna die because Tanjiro is chasing after these fucking random ass villagers to save them? It just made no sense. At, at no point did I actually think that any of them were in true danger. Some of the Mitsuri stuff that was like, going on, you know. Yeah, the backstory stuff with the Miss Tashira, it was pretty good, but I don't know. It did feel that it was lacking. No opinion coming off of the high that was season two's long momentum against the demonic sibling duo. Season, season two three was, so was a big letdown to me. It pains True. me to say that, especially with two Hashira getting focus in the same arc. But in my weekly consumption viewing, I can't say I really enjoyed it too much. For clarification's sake, Mitsuri and Tokito were actually both fine. I enjoyed. Mitsuri's backstory was not even like a thing. I mean, we kind of talked about how she was at a young age, such a strong girl that was a little bit different. I think that Tokito's backstory was very impactful. The whole revelation of the twin, that, that shit was insane. That was actually insane. But something about the enemies, Hantengu and the pot guy, they were more funny than dangerous. Genya just doing gun breathing was also fucking hilarious. But again, it's just the same level of desperation and danger. I, it was just not there, which was in season two. Enjoy the focus that they did get, and their presence was more than welcome. On top of that, though I would have liked to see more insight into the Swordsmith Village and their origins with the Demon Slayers, I always enjoy the idea of blacksmiths, so the environment itself got a plus one from me. I love that one blacksmith that continued to ignore, not Hanteng with the other guy, the jar guy, and kept, you know, Working on the sword, ignoring an upper rank, even after the shed was gone. What a giga shed. My dislike of the arc truly stemmed from two main aspects, okay. starting with the upper moons. I hate that I have to compare, but Daki and Gyutaro meant some serious business back in season yep. 2. Of all the fights that I have seen within the Shonen Spear, that whole battle yep. was one of the hardest fights for survival I have ever seen. The entirety of season 2, as soon as Daki and Gyutaro showed up, my god. Every episode was like, shit, can we actually do this? This is insane. Not even Tanjiro. Like, remember when Inosuke seemingly died, but he shifted around his organs, so that was fucking crazy? And again, it, it's just that wasn't there in season 3. The way they would tie and deliver injury after injury had people sweating and screaming. <laughs> Your boy Roshi! In shock. I expected this level of intensity to carry over for every upper moon we'd encounter going forward. Same. But in season 3, I didn't get that feeling at all. Even though they were upper moons, I had a hard time taking either of them seriously. Seriously, especially exactly. When one is constantly talking to the point where I was begging Tokito to wrap it up ASAP. The other, while having. The pot guy, the jar guy. I actually liked him a lot just because of how, like, funny he was. But funny kind of ruins the immersion of these upper moons who's supposed to be so dangerous and cold and you're supposed to feel that level of, you know, threat. Again, it just wasn't there. Having a pretty cool blood demon art didn't do much for me either. Even with some very cool moments, it was hard for me to be deeply invested when I couldn't really get down with the antagonist. Which mm. is a shame because again, the Hashira were cool. Mitsuri ended up surprising me with such an incredible use of flexibility in both blade and body maneuvering. The second 
Yes, body maneuvering. I love the love breathing stuff. It's like, what the fuck? That's crazy. And then to realize that love breathing actually is, you know, uh, uh what's it called? A derivative of Rengoku's sun breathing, right? Or not sun breathing, sorry. Uh, the different breathing techniques that he had, because Mitsuri was the actual apprentice, right? second issue is within the finale itself, and that deals with Nezuko conquering the sun. Look, yeah, I'll just cool. tell it how I took it, but I wasn't a huge fan of the execution for this, per se. Oh. Apparently, it wasn't explained well in the manga, but the anime had its own explanation with her body evolving in preparation to conquer the sun. I've also seen people say that it was because Nezuko consumed some of the blue spider lily as a child. I still have yet to get a concrete solution, but yeah, where I'm at right now is not fond of it in the slightest. This the anime definitely didn't really give an explanation that I don't think they were trying to I think they're trying to keep it hidden right there I'm pretty sure is the relevant information of how Nesco did that is going to be shown later but yes I have read some comments regarding people's you know theories or more or less spoilers. This is not me saying that she needed to die because it's obvious why she had to live but the path that got us to that moment did not land for me even after everything the Ohio moment it was impactful. It was definitely one of the better moments of season three. Obvious why she had to live, but the path that got us to that moment did not land for me. Even after everything I've said though, I'm sure many of you all are still looking at me a little crazy. So let me change my gears and move towards right. Hashua training. Now from my understanding, Hashua training in the manga is exactly 11 chapters and as such initially seemed impossible to stretch into a full anime season. How did they do that? 11 chapters? put into fucking an entire season of anime in eight episodes and not even just eight episodes the first episode was also like an hour long was it not i forget but the last two were longer than the traditional like 22 to 24 minute episodes it was like 30 and then 40 respectively or something like that that is until we were met with some very unique circumstances of eight episodes with the entire season having more anime original content than anything i've seen in the yeah. past few years and there was some good moments for Hashira only scenes to flesh them out, but goddamn, the 10 airplane scene was insane. Outright, Hashua training is pretty much Tanjiro running a level up gauntlet, tackling different areas of stats in order to reach the prime Hashira physique. Even so, leading up to the finale, there were quite a few things that managed to capture my attention. This Anytime Sanami and Iguro were on screen, they were great moments. I enjoyed their anime only scenes. This year, starting with the Hashira meeting, the marks that appear on the Demon Slayer's bodies are essentially marks of death. It's pretty easy to fill in the blanks, but to think that Tokito and Mitsuri may inevitably die already hurts and only furthers the thought that all of these Hashira may cease to exist by the time. What did you say? What? What, 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 what? Finale, there were quite a few things that managed to capture my attention this year. Starting with the Hashira meeting, the marks that appear on the Demon Slayer's bodies are essentially marks of death. It's- Was this confirmed in the episode? I don't remember a specific mechanic of if you have the Hashira mark that you will die. It's a mark of death. I thought this was just a simple heightened elevated form. What the fuck does that mean? What? pretty easy to fill in the blanks, but to think that Tokito and Mitsuri may inevitably die already hurts and only- What are you- what is this guy talking about right now? He's making it sound like it's a mark of death where you're surely gonna die. Now, people will probably die in the, you know, Infinity Castle arc, no doubt. But just because you have the Demon Slayer mark, it's making it sound like the anime told us that you're gonna die. I don't- are we watching the same shit? He furthers the thought that all of these Hashira may cease to exist by the time the story is completely over. This was my first indication that the series is truly aiming to bring this all to an end very soon. And I'm very confused on how he interpreted that, but okay. On top of that, we also had Lady Tamayo cooperating with Shinobu. Two pretty important developments looking at the impending climax while delivering on more character expansion. Tamayo goaded, bro. And like, at the end of Hashira training arc, right? Tamayo was still stuck to Muzan. Wonder if she's gonna have any lines in the beginning of Infinity Castle, because like, they're still stuck together, you know? She's still got like her arm through his chest, like, what's gonna happen with Tamayo next season? 
Before I get to them, I do want to mention that I found it somewhat intriguing that the Demon Slayers had no idea that the Infinity Castle existed. Mm. Even after all this time, the demons had as much of their own territory outside of just the Cloak of Night as it much as the, the Demon secret. Slayers had their headquarters hidden away beyond the Wisteria. Yep. It made me think just how exactly would the finale be approached, especially when the Infinity Castle moves and reconstructs itself as if it were its own living entity. And talking about how we end and lead into the Infinity Arc, I, I thought this is one of the coolest way to end the season and also waste no time as, you know, season five starts. Because how did season four end? With everyone being ported into the Infinity Castle Arc. Now, when season five begins, there is no setup required. Immediately, we're already dropped in and we get right into the action. It was just the perfect way of ending season four, having the most hype surrounding this arc. And when season five begins, or, you know, the movies, they can just get right into it. Setting that aside for now though, we finally were able to get around to more context involving Giyu, Giyome, the Shinizugawa yeah. brothers, and a small tease of personal Shibuya. impending conflicts with Shinobu and Zenitsu. All yeah, so like, Shinobu's sister got her head cut off, which I'm assuming was by Doma. Zenitsu got that letter, which probably was bad news regarding his master and why he's so locked in now, which I love. Giyu's thing was, you know, him not thinking that he was worthy of being a Hashira, therefore he denounced himself, even though he is a Hashira because his best friend carried him in the exam. Giyome got snitched out by Sayo, who was like a seven-year-old kid that fucking lied, but apparently in the manga, that girl was not such a demon. In the anime, it made her seem like she snitched and made everything blamed on Giyome, but I hear it was not quite like that in the manga. Or if anything, Giyu has always been a much more calmer and monotone type person, and the weight he had on his heart needed to be uplifted by Tanjiro doing Tanjiro things. Giyome actually had a pretty tough backstory yeah. and is my favorite one yet. A blind and yet noble man with an Remember that he was shriveled up no nutrition because he gave all the food to the kids yet he still beat a fucking demon nerfed in this state while being blind how insane is that one yet a blind and yet noble man with an unfortunate origin dealing with demons and the accidents that occur within a child's innocence can't forget to mention that mr triple platinum wives came mm. back for a bit i'm not saying i think that now we didn't see him in part of the group, right, when everyone got ported into the Hashira, uh, sorry, Infinity Arc. But there was some dialogue be in a couple episodes, especially like this specific episode when Tanjiro was in the training squad there, of talks of like him wanting to come out of retirement and join in the fight. So we might get some backup later that you never expected. Saying that this was game changing content, but it's content that I enjoyed for the most part. And if these characters are about to meet their end, then at least nobody can say that we didn't get the level of context Kotoge wanted us to have as far as characterization goes. We clearly still have more context to receive given mm, the brothers, Sanami. as well as Shinobu and Zenitsu, still have some serious business to settle. And I think those contexts will be dealt with flashbacks during their important fights against demons. And I just feel like Sanemi and Genya have yet to resolve their brotherly bonds. So one way or the other, I think one of these two will be in danger and the other brother will save them through action because they just can't. They're too tsundere to talk it over, right? So with action, maybe Genya's in trouble and Sanami saves them or vice versa. And then they'll realize that, oh no, I actually cared about you at the end of the day. And Shinobu stuff, again, we need to get more details on like who cut the, her sister's head off. But it's pretty obvious. The only, you know, upper moon that has associations with pretty women and heads is Doma. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Shinobu and Zenitsu still have some serious business to settle. But I imagine these moments are probably the highlights of the final arc. Speaking of which, can we talk about how Zenitsu locked the f*** in? Yes. I don't know what was on that letter he received, but I'm damn excited to find out come the movie. Consider it's so hype. Based. And... I'm sure this is the art, the reason why people say, like, let Zenitsu cook. People hate Zenitsu. Most anime only fucking despise this guy because he's designed to be annoying. The only time that he's amazing is when he's fucking knocked out. In that subconscious mode where he uses, you know, his lightning, like, breathing techniques. It's a f thunder breathing techniques. It's fucking amazing. But, like, that is the reason, right? His character is centered around this gap moe. This contrast between conscious fucking annoying perv versus subconscious you know godlike animation just amazing fighter 
But it's just he was never my favorite character. He was still so fucking annoying until the lead up of the end of the Hashira training. And when he locked in, I was like, hold the fuck up. I see the potential. I see the potential. But it is so unreasonable to expect an audience to like accept this character. If you're a manga reader and you knew what was going to happen to Zenitsu in the future, fine. But like, you can't expect an anime only audience to just go through four seasons and just be willing to accept Zenitsu for what he is when you've clearly seen how annoying he is. But I'm very excited for him in the movies. Considering his behavior has always been his most serious when unconscious, him being awake and laser focused is stupidly hype. At this time, I don't know what exactly was originally part of the arc and how much is new, but even so, it's appreciated. <laughs> the paper airplane shit, bro. It's just crazy how they actually said let's throw 10 airplanes and they actually threw 10 airplanes to pad the time. Filler animation. It is especially when we got some scuffles from the Hashira here and there. My only wish is that we got more. I would have yeah. paid a lot of money to see Mitsuri fight Tokito. Tanjiro's influence in regards to the other swordsmen was also kind of cool to see. The acknowledgement of him being in a league of his own and still trying to push on isn't bad, regardless if these guys make some major impact or not. The heart of the Demon Slayers lie within their own humanity and struggle to push on. And with all these showcases per that? training site, it ties tied really nicely into the finale exchange between the leaders of the respective groups. I'm gonna come off my usual sensibility here and lean more into the hype for a bit, but this right. finale is a straight Hall of Famer. Yes, 10 out of 10 episode. Like, <laughs> there's these specific episodes when you watch anime that just makes you feel like, oh my god, I am proud to watch anime. This is the peak of peaks. Some of those episodes, I think, in the past has, for me has been... Perhaps Eminence in Shadow, Season 1, Episode 5, you know, I'm Atomic Moments. Maybe Classroom of the Elite, Season 2, Episode, what was it, 10? I don't know, Anakoji versus fucking Ryuin, or even like season Classroom of the season, uh, Elite, Season 3 for me, when, you know, Koenji and, you know, Yama got shit. And then Demon Slayer, Season 4 finale, like, this was amazing. This was like 10 out of 10 episode. It was so fucking peak. It was so good that it made me ignore all the bullshit of filler animation that led up to the finale like that single episode just like redeemed the entire season for me that's how good it was Imagine if your greatest enemy of all time came to your house to get rid of you. And not only do you leave him with an exchange that pretty much opposes his ideals and pursuit of eternity, but then you blow yourself, your wife, mm -hmm. and kids up just to create an opening for your will to be carried yeah. on. Then Crazy shit actually went down like a messiah. It's not that the master was in danger. It was Muzan in danger walking into a fucking tiger's den. Y'all thought that the master wasn't danger because Mulan's coming. It's like, no, it was the other way around. And the slow realization during their dialogue as a master just like roasts Muzan, it's fucking crazy. The whole monologue, remember the time? The thing that really just like changed my perspective of how bad it actually might be was when they talked about how if the master dies, it's fine because the other demon slayers will simply become more emboldened through the sacrifice and be more willing to fight against Muzan and defeat the demon slayers. But if Muzan dies, that's it. That's the end of the demons, right? And at that point, I was like, holy shit. Things actually might not be as bad as I thought. One of his own flips the script and injects him with the means that would Tamayo actually man. do them. Followed by the strongest demon slayer currently alive coming out and yes. showing the hell out. Gyome just like not saying much throughout the whole season or even the whole series. Just very quiet, dude. And as soon as he sees Muzan, he's like, Muzan done! And it's just like, oh, it's so fucking hype. The soundtrack going is insane. The animation just like cracks to like 12 out of 10. What a way to kick off the prologue to yeah. your final arc with the bar of quality so and good. motion that people have been raving about Demon Slayer to have for the past. And this is why Unga Bunga Slayer is such a highly perceived show. Not because the story writing is amazing, not because they have the most in-depth characters. I understand that's a battle shonen. I understand that the movie tier animation from Studio Ufotable is heavily carrying Demon Slayer, but they know how to do hype right. They know how to get people excited. Sometimes you don't need a complex story. Sometimes, all you need is just hype unga boonga happening and goddamn, this shit was hype. Past couple of years now, the OSTs and voice acting was on point and yep. the setup was textbook shonen good food. All the soundtrack specifically? My god. 
the whole soundtrack, as soon as they got into the Infinity Castle arc, there's a specific moment when Zenitsu, you know, locks in, as well as the final moment where Muzan is like, so you think that you put me in danger? No, tonight, you and all the Demon Slayers will die. And then the whole exchange is like, you know, you know, Kibutsuzi Muzan, I'll get you! And then Kamado Tanjiro, Muzan saying Tanjiro's name, and the soundtrack going the entire time as it goes into the fucking credits. Holy shit, that is how you end the season and get people hyped up. All the Hashiras and the main character arriving at the same time, all of them summoning their breathing techniques and Tanjiro going straight to the Hinokami Kagura. And right when they plan to settle this right here and now, a simple Boing. pluck of an instrument shows Boing. who really is in control Boing. of the situation here. The cherry so on top, everyone, no matter where they were in the area. <laughs> Even fucking... Mr. Murata, bro, I'm very excited for his participation in the Infinity Castle arc because a lot of people are hyping this, you know, seemingly pointless character who is like the most giga NPC character. I'm excited to see what he's going to be doing, bro. Maybe he's the one that gets Muzan down. You never know. Where they were in the area was brought to face off in the Infinity Castle. Can you imagine taking a shower and then randomly summoned and having mm -hmm. to fight for your life? God, I'd be pissed. Can you imagine if you were mid jacking off, then you got summoned? I don't know what to expect going forward, and episodes like these make me happy that I do not read the manga. There are emotions that either yes. being a reader or an anime only can bring, and I'm glad I'm going in blind. The scale of saying, oh, this moment, Zenitsu being locked in the whole soundtrack playing at this current time. Oh, it's so good. How? How is this so hype? It's just Zenitsu just like saying nothing. Stoic face, but because of the character that you've known for four fucking seasons changing like this with the soundtrack playing. And as you know that we're entering into the final arc of this Demon Slayer saga, it's, it's crazy. Of this final battle is unimaginable given how the Infinity Castle seems so to work, good. and I cannot imagine what lies ahead. The only complaint I really have is the fact that it's going to be another movie trilogy format. Yeah, that is the thing that I really hate. Well, of course, as an anime reactor right on YouTube, it's better for me to have multiple episodes of a season to pump out and farm content rather than have movies. And on top of that, movie releases, if it's not, I'm not sure exactly how they're going to release it, but remember movies such as Kaguya-sama, Love is War? Anytime you have like movies that's locked in Japan, it doesn't come for a long time to streaming services until much, much later. So shit like that's kind of annoying. Well, I don't know how, what's going to happen with our channel when you know, we cover Demon Slayer stuff. I, I personally really hope. And like, if... We look at the facts of what Demon Slayer has done so far with the movies. What did they do with the Mugen Train? They made a movie. It did amazing. Then they had season two with a couple episodes which covered Mugen Train again, right? And then same with the Hashira training arc. They had a movie and then they made a, a season out of it. I find it feasible to believe that the trilogy movies will then be adapted into anime seasons. And if they do that shit, oh my god, that would be amazing. This in particular isn't going to be my first rodeo with Ufotable. Shout out to all my Fate fans out there. It's gonna be kind of tough to cover these movies if I wanted to, and reactors are gonna have to wait extra long for it to hit the online. He knows. He knows the reactor's pain. Line space on top of our already long wait per movie. Of course. I mean. I guess I could take you guys to the movie theater and I could have like a tripod standing with my phone and we could fucking react to the movie through a fucking camp. No, that would be a terrible experience. I would never do that. If they decide to do it globally and release on the same day, then I'll yield. But for now, what can you do? For eight episodes, that was more so about training than anything. I gotta give it to Demon Slayer because you typically don't get such a large amount of additions to a section of a story, but unusual circumstances can lead to unique opportunities. Either way, I know- Unusual circumstances leads to unique opportunity, as in Ufotable wanted to milk the shit out of Demon Slayer so hard that they decided to make a fucking movie and then adapt 8 episode season worth of 3 11 fucking chapters? Sure, unique opportunity my ass. Nah man, they just saw the fucking money on the IP. Which makes me hope that the trilogy movies of Infinity Castle will also be milked to its fullest and give me the fucking seasons of anime. 
know I'm excited, I know a lot of people are excited, and I plan to be there every premiere night to see how this story wraps up. And at the end of the day, if something is going to end on an epic note, then you might as well go out with the mm -hmm. highest bar possible. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it's gonna bring me to the end of this video. As always, thank you very much for watching, and let me know all your thoughts about the latest Demon Slayer content in the comment section down below. Be safe. I think that he had a lot of good points to be made, and before I give my take, hold on. Guys, please go give Mr. Yozakura Sensei a like on the video. You know, sub to his channel if you haven't. That's a pretty good breakdown of Demon Slayer in a nutshell in Season 5. But here's my take on it, right? I think that Demon Slayer Season 4, sorry, um, the Hashira training arc, the finale was amazing, amazing, and there was a couple episodes in between. I, I think that the... Um, the second last episode, episode 7 and episode 8 were really good. Episode 7 was pretty good, episode 8 was fucking perfect. And there was a couple, maybe just one episode in the beginning. I think it was a specific episode with um, Iguro, Sanami, and uh, Mitsuri uh, training arc where, you know, Tanjiro almost had a brawl. Those are the only memorable episodes and everything else was extremely mid, extremely stretched out to the point where I'm like, what the fuck are we doing? But again, because of how good the finale was, it is making me just not even care about all the weak episodes. That's how good it was. And I'm willing to just just cast aside all the other heinous filler animations, like the 10 airplanes, to the point where I would agree that the impression that Hashira training left on me was much more significant than the Swordsmith Village arc. Even if you take Swordsmith Village arc and then Hashira training, and maybe there's more episodes in the Swordsmith Village arc that was better than Hashira training because of simply the lack of pacing, you know, since the training arc. The finale just solidifies that experience higher on me, right, than the Swordsmith Village. But that's it for me.